Uh, good afternoon. My name is Fred Collier, Jr. I'm a chief city planner with the Cleveland City Planning Commission. Appointed by President Obama and unanimously confirmed by the U.S. Senate, Ron Sims served for two years as the Deputy Secretary for the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. As the second most senior official at HUD, Sims managed the day-to-day -day operations of an agency with 8,500 employees and an operating budget of nearly $40 billion. Prior to his appointment at HUD, Sims served for 12 years as the elected executive of Martin Luther King Jr. County in Washington State the 13th largest county in the nation with 1.8 million residents and 39 cities, including the cities of Seattle, Bellevue, and Redmond. As county executives, Sims was nationally recognized for his work on the integration of environmental, social equity, and public health policies that produce groundbreaking work on climate change, health care reform, affordable housing, mass transit, environmental protection, land use, and equity and social justice. Please join me in giving a warm City Club welcome to Mr. Ron Sims. Well, it's great being here in Cleveland once again, and it's great being at City Club. The, um, you know, when I retired from HUD and went back home, my wife said, good, now I get to see you. There's no more travel. And I'm hoping that that's what she will continue to believe, since I have been on the road a lot. But when Cleveland came up, I said, it's a very special place. And I wanted to go to Cleveland. And I asked for her forbearance, and she gave that to me. Now, it's interesting. I will talk about my family a lot, in part because they are my best teacher. I have a, a marvelous wife. She speaks four languages. Tagalog, Spanish, English, uh, and Tagalog. And uh, she said in her school system, if you only spoke one language, the bulbs didn't burn too brightly, which is how she has treated her monolingual husband. The, um, when we first, uh, before we got married, there was a series of negotiations. And I said, you know, that over half the families in America get divorced over money. So there has to be one person in charge of the money. She says, you're lousy at it. So I said, I'll just give her the money, and after a while, she will, she will basically say, you know, okay, you can be in charge, but I have spent my entire career in public office on an allowance. The, um, <laughs> I have three sons. I have Douglas, who is my, I always said he wasn't focused at birth and not focused now, but it's not true. He's been always very, very incisive. I have a son, Daniel, who wishes to go into public office, and I've tried to tell him there are other careers that pay more. The, uh, and then I have Aaron, Aaron the last. Uh, Aaron was a pleasant surprise, but my last one. So I would tell you what they mean to me in the context of sustainability and the fact that place is very, very significant and determinative in this country. On the global scale, it's really interesting. I would, uh, when we look, and I was, you know, I was, I got here yesterday afternoon, so I walked around all of downtown. Then I went out late last night because there's two different kinds of a city: always your afternoon city, and then your late evening city. And I was looking at the lighting that was done, and the people on the street, and the voices, and the various restaurants, and the scenes. And I went, "Wow, this place reminded me." of a place that I now have lived, Seattle. It was really interesting. Years and years ago, years ago, there were a group of us who were ministers and called Operation Night Watch. Ours was never to judge. Ours was to go on the streets at 10 o'clock at night and meet people and whatever needs they had to address those needs. We were the place of last resort. We did not preach. We just did not judge. Our job was service. And if you did inquire we were there, we would tell you. We had callers so that the, the police officers would realize that we were Operation Night Watch and would not arrest us, along with a lot of the other people who were engaged in a series of behaviors that were disturbing. But nonetheless, they were there. So I was walking around last night, and I said, I remembered when Seattle had more of a problem downtown than Cleveland. I remember when Seattle was a place that you left at 5 o'clock and were glad 
But today it's vibrant all day long, and that is exactly what downtown Cleveland was last night. As people went to these various restaurants and their clubs, I remember judging a place by Starbucks because it's the hometown company in our area. So I went there because Starbucks tells all. And it was just great because there were all these young people with their lattes sitting there with their computers using a free Wi-Fi system. I said, oh, I must be home because it's raining too. <laughs> so what? does Cleveland, the metropolitan area, tell me? I always, in the HUD, we used to have words to describe jurisdictions. We had those that were robust. We could feel those. You know, the, for whatever reason, a New York or a Boston was robust. But we had also cities that we said seemed to be on the verge, on the verge. And when I first got there, they called them cities in transition. And I said, that's really annoying, because you can tradition backwards or tradition forward. Who thought of that word? Well, nobody would ever raise their hand. So I just coined a phrase. I said, verge cities. Cities that we know are pulling themselves together in such an extraordinary well that they will be dominant this century. And that's really important. There's got to be another Midwest city other than Chicago that's going to be dominant. In my opinion, as you look at what is happening by this beautiful city next to Lake Erie, it has the right political leadership. The county has gone through a huge transformation and has leadership. There's integration of purpose. So I would look and tell you, if you can't believe in Cleveland, please leave. Because there's a lot of other people who are going to be believing in Cleveland and coming here. So what is a destination? Why would I move here? One is, I can tell you that you're restoring your downtown. Never in the history of civilization have people congregated and allowed its core to die. To allow its core to die is to allow the region to fail. There has never been, ever been, in any society, in any country, in any century, where the core could die. So you need a vibrant downtown, and you're seeing that with the apartments that are being built here, with the arts and the activities that are being built here. Seattle didn't have a vibrant downtown. It closed at 5 o'clock. And all of a sudden, several things happened. I remember when the museum said it was going to build downtown, and the symphony hall said it was going to be built downtown, and we saved the Paramount Theater and the Fifth Avenue Theater, and then Norm Rice, who was the best man at my wedding, who was also the mayor, I always said to Norm, he had a smaller jurisdiction than I had because I had the entire county, but nonetheless, he is a very wonderful friend, decided that people should move downtown. And he took on an area that had what we call single room occupancy housing, a lot of taverns, a place that everybody had forgot, a place that only Operation Night Watch were willing to go into and serve people and decided that that was going to become a multi-income, owner-occupied, a lot of condos and apartment buildings. And my God, he moved forward and he called it, you know, his urban island project was going to be downtown. He had a number of urban island projects, but this one could be downtown. And everybody screamed and yelled and said, he is, you know, look what, he's going to force us to live downtown. Downtown Seattle is the fastest growing issue, excuse me, neighborhood in all of King County, second only to Bellevue's out, uh, fastest growing downtown. So we look at that people wanted to move downtown. It's now vibrant. It's been transformative. And city of Seattle, and I always say you don't move to our area because of the weather. Trust me. I mean, you guys complain about the little bit of rain you get. Ours is constant. We have 72-day growing season. We're the only place in the United States of America where six weeks of sunshine is considered to be a magnificent year. <laughs> and we will take that sunshine and say, wow, it's sunny today. This is the best place in the world to live, and we stay there. We gained a congressional seat. Why? Because it was a transformation of its major metropolitan area. It attracted young people. It was green. It was clean. It had a number of schools that worked. It simply was an area that nobody wanted to give up on. But I was very annoyed recently by an announcement that Intel was expanding in Portland. Because there are three cities that I always consider to be in competition, Vancouver, Canada, the city of Seattle, and Portland, Oregon. 
And there was Portland once again announcing an expansion of Intel. And once again, there would be a gazillion young people running down into that technology corridor for jobs. In a city that believes it is better than Seattle and King County, mistakenly. And, but there they would. But they did something that we didn't. We had the lottery of the luck of the womb. Bill Gates was born in our area. And he came. And he's always said that you cannot grow based upon the lottery of the luck of the womb. That an area has to be attractive. And there's no question that Microsoft has done an extraordinary job of attracting people. Our other lottery winner from the womb was Bill Boeing, who grew up there and established the Boeing Company. So here you had two, two major companies that transformed an area, and we have built upon that, but not Portland. Portland went out for 10 years looking for people that would locate there. Under considerable ridicule by everybody saying, why are all these public officials and business people on these boondoggles going out and all around the world? They had made a decision after looking at their strengths and weaknesses that they wanted to be the place where chips were manufactured. They wanted to be the chip capital of the world. And people said, how do they do that? They went to businesses, if you re re relocate in our area, we promise you a workforce that will know how to design, manufacture, and code them. For 10 years, then all of a sudden, one company came, and another company came. So I envy them in many respects because they didn't wait for a birth to take place that would transform their community. They went out in an organized fashion political leaders and business leaders after doing a rigorous assessment and went after companies to locate there. It has driven their economy and has driven their growth. So that when Mayor Kitz Governor Kitzhaber was speaking, he said by 2050 we expect three million new people between Portland, Oregon, and what we call the metropolitan area, the Central Puget Sound. That'll be several more districts in a rainy, cold, place with six weeks of good weather. So I look and say Cleveland has everything it needs to do that. Foundations, which are marvelous here, marvelous here, cutting edge work, political leadership and business leadership. The only thing stopping Cleveland from overtaking many other places is Cleveland. Nothing is more powerful than belief. I remember coaching kids in football. And I remember one time, and we were 71 and 1 over the years. And people, and we always beat better teams. People said, how you did it? I said, because we would practice acting like the game was over. I would teach them how to walk. How do you look like the game is already over? There is a way to carry yourself. So the game is already over. And I said when the neighborhood teams would talk a lot of smack, just look at them with a wry face like, what? <laughs> you know, how dare you play on this field? And I think that that is true with adults as well. The issue is if you believe you're going to be magnificent, you will be. If you don't believe that, you won't be. You're on the verge of being an extraordinary place if you believe. So I want to talk about some of the problems. But I want to say hello to some people from HUD that I dearly love and respect. They're right back here in the corner. When I was going back to Washington, D.C. once, I brought my family with me. And I remember telling my kids, it was a press conference. And I said to my kids, go to the press conference and get all the paper you can. They said, Dad, what do you mean, paper? I said, all the paper you can. Get all of it. All of it. But I want no duplicates. They said, well, you mean they're going to have a lot of paper? I said, it's D.C. It's a press conference. Get the paper. So they brought the paper to me. And I'll never forget reading it. It was a report by the Joint Center, which is an African-American think tank in Washington, D.C. And it was chaired at that time by Ronald Dellums in terms of the report called the Dellums Report shorthand. 
And the report said an interesting thing. It said 35% of African American males under the age of 35 would have nothing in common with the rest of the society except their death. And my kids, I was reading that report, my kids said, oh, dad, this is hardcore inner city stuff. So I went, whoa, I wonder if it's happening in King County. Dad, we don't have these problems in King County. I mean, this is hardcore. So I took it back to our demographers and I said to them, now, here's a report. I mean, I'm really intrigued by the report. Can you all tell me what our trends are? What, what does it mean? It took 18 months, which is, you know, for, for a group that's used to working fast, I said there must be something they're really churning over that they don't want to tell the exec. And sure enough, I'll never forget the report. The report was simple. The report said the high water mark for African Americans and Latinos in King County was 1970. Now this is the county that elected Norm Rice as an African American mayor. Gary Locke is a county executive and I replaced Gary when he became governor. The first time that the three major political offices in a state were held by people of color in its history. This state gave birth to us, a community that's been blue organizationally and politically, that's what we call it, a democratic county, liberal by all parts. The high watermark for African Americans was 1970. 50% home ownership, 48% two parents in a household. In 2006, 32% home ownership, 28% two parents in a household. We could predict the lifetime earnings of children by race. We could look at morbidity rates and say if you're an African-American male, you were likely to die of complications of heart disease and diabetes and high blood pressure. Really clear. You would die in the average age of 68. Latinos had a similar and dramatic fall. Some subgroups of Asians had a fall. But the thing that was more troubling than anything is we could predict it by zip code. Zip codes are a life determinant. Zip codes kill. They're not just an address. We can look at, for instance, if you're in one zip code, we can tell you that your medical treatment for diabetes is going to be an amputation. If you're in another zip code, it's going to be a pharmaceutical. People say that's not true. It is true. That we all of a sudden, for a lot of reasons, have disparate ways in which we treat disease. We can tell you that you can be a poor black kid and 98118 and you're going to make 60% of what a poor black kid does in 98144. Because the issue wasn't poverty, it was zip code. We can tell you that if you want seniors to walk, then you have to have a walkable community. Do not tell a senior to get out of their house and have narrow sidewalks. And poorly lit streets, you have wide sidewalks, distances between traffic and where they're walking, and not don't have 90 degree curves. You cut out that curve because nobody wants to see around 90 degree curve. You can't. Senior citizens want to see trouble before it arrives. They want to feel safe. So all of a sudden we realized that in all the things that we were doing, with all the programs we were doing, we were never ever making an adjustment for place, how neighborhoods look. Parks, a park a quarter mile away from a house, a kid, any house, a quarter mile away, we realized that those communities on average, will not have obesity problems, and especially their kids. And people build gyms and community centers and go down to the gym and go to the community center. My kids were ballers. Why don't you, why, you don't send a kid to a gym because if you don't got game, you don't play, <laughs> right? So you develop a system of parks a quarter mile away so kids can play with their skill level peers. Parks a quarter mile away. If a park is a half mile away, we'll see a little bit more increase in obesity. If it's three quarters of a mile away, we can predict obesity rates. And if it's more than a mile away, we can tell you that obesity gets to be at morbidity levels for the long time interest of those kids. So where a park is. We have bicycle paths all over. 170, 125 miles of paved bike lanes in King County. And I remember a friend of mine, Rod Brandon and I, we'd go down, we'd be riding, and I'd say to Rod, there ain't nobody who looks like us. 
And Rod would say, I know, you know, we need to address the fact that, you know, why not? So we took a map. There were no bicycle paths in any poor community anywhere in King County. If you were an affluent community, you had a lot of them. So I remember Mayor Greg Nichols deciding to build under a power line pathways. And people said, oh, well, it never worked. It's packed. Because people have a safe way to walk around their neighborhood and see other neighbors. So all of a sudden, before we left, we said, why don't we go ahead and, and realize that poor people are entitled to bike paths and running paths and walking paths. And if you don't do it, you're sentencing people to poor health and their children to poor health. And the issue, can we resolve these and the answer is, yes, we can. It means to focus your investment on the zip codes where you are having the most extraordinary problem. And you say, well, who else is doing that? Austin, Texas. They annoy me. But here's the reason why Austin does. <laughs> They have the world's fastest computer. They are flush. They are the fastest growing, one of the fastest growing cities in the country and the fastest at attracting young people under the age of 35 who have advanced college degrees. They are, people just moving. My dentist, who is rated as one of the best in, the, in, in our area, is moving to Austin, Texas. It was no worse news for me. I, mean, I said to him, Maybe I need to keep my braces so you'll stay around. You know, he said, no, I got a good person who just bought my practice. Oh, thank you very much. Heart through, nice through my heart. But nonetheless, Austin's attractive. Austin made a decision that had eight areas, eight neighborhoods in one zip code. And it needed to change them. They constituted 80% of its crime, 80% of the people going to emergency rooms, 72% of the people who are failing in their schools. Fix it. So they did it. They had decided that Austin cannot transform itself, and it is transforming at a very rapid rate. I mean, everybody's down there right now. The world's fastest computer was designed by a biologist and a computer engineer, so every med company is going down there now because they want that time on the machine. You look at Facebook just moved down there. You look at all the, you know, the, all of the majors that are out there. Microsoft has an office there. Everybody's come down there because everybody wants to build themselves around that computer technology culture. But their highest priority was the poorest neighborhood because they realized that that poorest neighborhood would define them. Define them because it's right next to their downtown. They wanted to change its look, its feel, and its outcome. So I've always said that in the place that I live, now live, my hometown, that we have to do the same thing because the world of competition is going to be based upon how people perceive how people live. A core city cannot fail in a region. If it does, the region fails. But it has to be everybody in that city because people are mobile and how people look and people's sense of it. And more importantly, Businesses do not want to be the ATM machine for poor planning. They don't, and they know they will. So I would say that Cleveland, you're on the verge of being able to do something really extraordinary. The place by Lake Erie. I remember giving a speech in Seattle about the importance of water. The governor, when I first got there, called up on the phone and says, I need you to work on the Puget Sound Partnership. Because the Puget Sound has been compromised by decades and decades and decades of fertilizers and chemicals. And the idea is we know what he wants to lose it. And so I use Cleveland as an example. I remember saying Cleveland was once marked as a city where the river caught on fire. Very unfair. But it was marked that way. But that ain't Cleveland anymore. Lake Erie has been reclaimed. It's a place that is greening out and a place that is so on the verge of being extraordinary. And the real issue is that you and Cleveland want to be extraordinary. But you will not be if you allow neighborhoods to linger in their poverty and their disproportionality in terms of outcomes. You will be like any place else. People will see it and feel it. I remember when the White House had an event and Quincy Jones was there. And I said to him, 
you know, Mr. Jones, I love your story about you and your brother Richard looking out the window one day of your house right across from Garfield High School. Now, if you look at Quincy Jones's house, as Quincy will probably say, it wasn't all that great then and ain't all that great now. Right across to you from Garfield High School, wondering what anybody would ever hear his music who hasn't heard of Quincy Jones anywhere in the world. And his brother, Richard, used to, used to say, I want to, Jim, I want to be a lawyer. I just want to be a lawyer. Richard Jones is federal district court judge, Richard Jones. And all those communities that people give up on are geniuses and extraordinary people who, given the opportunity, can't aspire to be transformative. Can't aspire if given the chance. If given the chance. In the most globally competitive age in the history of human, 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 humankind, we have to focus on making sure that everybody can compete. We need as many people rowing the boat as we possibly can. Every community has to have that. We can afford no loss. I have a very perfect granddaughter. She is perfect. She says the magic word grandpapa, and I say the magic word yes. <laughs> and when my son complained that I gave her ice cream and cake for breakfast, I said yes, I did. And he said, you never gave us or allowed us to have ice cream and cake for breakfast. I said, she asked, she got. And he said, no, 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 but dad, you never allowed us. I said, I'm not raising her. <laughs> but her world will be defined by the decisions being made now. Now. And the issue is whether she will be surrounded by extraordinary people endeavoring to keep this grand experiment called America an enduring nation for the rest of the century. We are the only country, only country in human history that's ever, ever been a nation of economic and military superiority without a common gene pool. We all got here by boat, plane, and land bridge. We are humankind's grand experiment. And the real issue is how we handle our metropolitan areas will define us. Counties cannot prosper with weak cities. Weak cities cannot prosper unless they have formed effective partnerships with their counties. There is no such thing as turf in this business. There's an issue about whether or not we wish to be competitive, whether we will act like the champions we are, or whether we will accept defeat. I will accept no defeat. I don't want to be the generation that gave up on a generation's future. I don't want my granddaughter looking back at me and saying, you coulda, you shoulda, you woulda, and you didn't. And the real issue is whether or not generations that come in Cleveland will look at you and say, magnificent. And it's within your grasp. It's not rocket science. It is not rocket science. Why should people live downtown? Because retirees get tired of mowing the lawn. <laughs> trust me. <laughs> really trust me. And that is why you want vibrant downtowns with parks and arts, because it's really clear that arts are a huge driver in every single society. I was in Zambia in the outs, I was way out, way out in the sticks. And I remember people still had art. They still had it. Desperately poor, and they still had art. The human beings require it. So parks and neighborhoods, Arts in neighborhoods and parks and arts downtown are very, very important. And that's why people want to come downtown. When you quit mowing your lawn and you're in a smaller place, you actually have money, which is why you just like good places to eat. <laughs> nice places to eat. And that's what you're fashioning. The issue is, do you have time on your side? I want to talk about that for a second. I told my kids that when my, very per my son, when my very perfect granddaughter was born, I cried. He said, why? I said, well, Doug, when you were in the birthing room, I got the whole birthing room to say, go, Doug. I didn't even know it was going to be a boy. That was just the first word that came out, go, Doug. It wasn't push, push, push. It was go, Doug. Then the nurses started saying, go, Doug. And then the doctor says, here comes Doug. Here comes Doug. I told my wife I was a perfect birthing coach. 
she said I was very annoying. <laughs> Nonetheless, there was this throbbing umbilical cord. And I remember the doctor saying, you want to cut the umbilical cord? I said, sure. And he said, here. And all of a sudden, I had an epiphany. The more umbilical cord, the better his chances. So he almost became the first person in medical history with a four-foot drying umbilical cord. <laughs> I said, no, 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 right here. So I cut it, and you get a moment of absolute terror and joy. So I watched my son cut my granddaughter's umbilical cord. I went, wow, where has time gone? How fast it has gone. And then I remember my family that I grew up in, my mom and my dad and my two brothers and, you know, all of the jokes and all of the hopes. I remember when they first bought their house, it was a teeny house, 1218 East Fifth Avenue, Spokane, Washington, 98502, 98509, area code 509-535-3601. <laughs> it's a teeny house. I remember that it's a teeny house. It was a tiny house, but it was my parents' first and only purchase, and it gave us roots. We moved in July 28th and handed out birthday cards for July 5th, and people said, what's wrong? I said, this is for next year, for the first time we knew we, where we were going to be next year. We're well past that house, well past that house. And I thought about that crazy little house when my twin brother succumbed five weeks ago. Where did time go? Where did it go? And why so fast? We still had a lot of growing up to do. More grandkids, more things to play. More secrets, more lies, more stories. Where did it go? But a higher authority than anybody in this room has determined that his journey is complete and his life was extraordinary. But that same higher authority has determined that your job is not done because you've been given a gift of life today, this week, this month, this year. So don't grab time and hold on to it as if time will wait for you. You must relish what you've been given and go after it with vigor. Everything says, Cleveland, get going. Everything. There isn't a single indicator you have that is so formidable it cannot be overcome. Place does have to matter. You have to make sure that the poor have benefits in this community so that their lives can be transformed. At the same time, you're going to have to make sure that seniors have a place to retire in a vibrant downtown and that the county areas can be a place where you can have businesses grow and young families grow. You have to have strong schools, ones that work, so you can go ahead and grab it and say, we're going to make it work and make it work and make it work until it does work. But it's all up to you. All of it's up to you. There's nothing I can give you on a data line that should change your mind other than the fact that I can't see how Cleveland can fail. But I know how it will fail if it does. It's not going to be because the residents are not waiting for you. It's not going to be because the business community is not waiting for you. It'll only be because people don't believe in each other. So it's your time. It is your time. I love sports. The difference between an all-star team is everybody wants to be an all-star. The difference between a championship team is they win championships. People do what it takes to do to be able to prevail and win. And all I'm asking you to do is be one of those extraordinary champions in the Midwest because there's going to be a place in the Midwest that explodes. There is going to be a place in the Midwest that becomes attractive. There's going to be a place in the Midwest that changes all the demographic numbers now of people fleeing and becomes that magnet of where people want to work, play, raise their kids, where businesses want to locate. And the real issue is, are you ready for that? It's been an honor and pleasure to speak at City Club. 
It was a pleasure to serve the president. The one thing the president taught me, though, I'll never forget, he sent, they sent me out all the time. All the time. All the time. I never wanted to see another hotel. I never wanted to be on another plane. But, oh, did I learn. I learned what works and what doesn't. In Cleveland, you have every tool in the toolkit to work. So I look forward to watching the extraordinary Cleveland, the beautiful city by the lake. Thank you. I want to ask everyone to do something for me. Just everybody just take a deep breath <laughs> and release. Uh, Ron, you were definitely uh, refreshing, and I think everyone in this room needed that. Uh, today, at the City Club of Cleveland, we are listening to a special program featuring Ron Sims, former Deputy Secretary for the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. We will return to our speaker momentarily for the traditional City Club questions. We encourage you to formulate questions for our speaker now and remind you that your questions should be brief and to the point. We remind you that, the, that members and guests alike are welcome to attend City Club forums and hope everyone listening will join the City Club. We hope you will join the City Club and become active in our ongoing civic dialogue. Please visit our website to see a full schedule of our upcoming programs. We welcome all of you here and those listening to WCPN 90.3 FM, WCLV, WTAM, or one of the many radio stations across the country. Our television broadcast partners are WVIZ, PBS, IdeaStream. Television broadcasts of the City Club are made possible by Cleveland State University and PNC. Our live webcast is supported by the University of Akron. In 2012, the City Club of Cleveland turns 100 years old. There are a number of events already happening and we'll be actively soliciting support for the community through our campaign for a new century. Our celebration continues with the Hope uh, and uh, Stanley uh, Adelstein High School essay contest. For, more, for information about our upcoming forums, please refer to our website www.cityclub.org and to learn more about the 100th anniversary events visit the 100th Anniversary tab on our website. If you wish to make reservations for upcoming programs or order a CD or DVD of today's program, please call 1-888-223-6786 or 216-621-0082. We are pleased to welcome guests at tables hosted by the friends of Councilman Joe Simperman, Neighborhood Progress, Inc., Place Matters, Ohio Grant Makers Forum, the St. Luke's Foundation of Cleveland, and the Swetland Center for Environmental Research at Case Western Reserve University and University Park Alliance. Thank you for joining us today. Today's program is sponsored by the St. Luke's Foundation. Joining us today at the head table is Denise San Antonio Zeman. Will you please uh, stand and be recognized? Now we would like to return to our speaker for our traditional City Club questions and answers period. We welcome questions from everyone, including guests. Holding the microphone today is City Club Program Director, Carrie Miller. Good evening, sir. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Okay. I'm sure you recently know that Cuyahoga County is just converted to an executive um, account-run system. Mm -hmm. My question to you is this. When you were um, executive for King County, what were some of the challenges that you incurred with the other mayors of the various municipalities within the county and also the, the mayor of Seattle itself when you had to make decisions in regards to the, when to benefit the whole region? 
far as far as economically or far as services, but also at the same time you have a de declining in funding for us on the state level and also on the federal level. How do you make the, the, a decision of working collectively as everyone working together was do what's do what's in the best interest for everyone involved? We um, our area was divided into probably we call South County, East County, North County, and then Seattle sh shoreline which made it very easy for us to be able to begin to calibrate. Those are very distinct areas, very distinct fields, very distinct problems, where they were transportation related, where they were environmentally related, where they were economic development issues. And we would plan around those variances. Our, one of the things that we, I spent a lot of time doing, though, was just talking. It was great being county executive. Uh, I didn't always agree with a city. Uh, I just couldn't in regards to, I mean, everybody wanted all the transit service. That this wasn't going to happen. We were a regional entity. Everybody wanted us to do their wastewater first. We were a regional wastewater agency. Everybody wanted us to devote all of our health care clinics to just their areas, and we couldn't do that. We had to realize that infectious diseases know no boundaries. On issues of clean water and clean air, we realized that clean water and clean air is something everybody wants. And so you try to balance, but we, we would talk through a lot of issues. Uh, we, we just talked and talked and talked and talked. We had three endangered species. And since I was the youngest county executive in the three areas, Pierce, King, and Snohomish, I got relegated to handling the endangered species issues, which became very defining. And there, I remember getting up saying one day, we're not going to sue the federal government for the listing, because we'll lose. Uh, why don't we just try to figure out a way to organize ourselves? I asked 400 people to show up, and I told them from the very beginning, I asked you 400 to come in because you're the only ones that have the wherewithal to sue. We don't need a suit. We need a collaborative process on a central Puget Sound basis. But it was a lot of discussion, a lot of communication, uh, and that's how executives, it's an exhausting job. Um, it is an exciting one when things work really well, but there's no easy formula for how you're going to disperse benefits. The one thing that was really clear, my relationship with the city of Seattle varied depending on who the mayor was. Norm Rice was my best man, easy relationship. There are people who resented Norm being my best man, the next mayor, and that became much more of a challenge. Um, and so, and then we had mayors who wanted city, uh, the city to be its own entity on transportation and health, and I would, I fought that. Said you don't have the authority to do that, and I'm not going, and I will not support you having your own transportation systems when you need a regional transportation system. I'm not going to support you having your own health department when you need a regional health department. So there were times when we worked very, very well together, and there were times where we had some significant challenges. Uh, but a lot, a lot of meetings and trying to find the common good. The issue to me was to tell everybody that there was no longer a city that should benefit and others lose. The issue was how could we get to a win-win. That isn't often the case. Sometimes you have win-loses, but you try to mitigate your loss as much as uh, possible because those residents are also county residents. Uh, I didn't, you know, that's the only way I know how to answer your question. It was no, there was no template. There was no guide. There was just personal relationships for the most part, and sometimes very contentious ones. That's right. Nice presentation. Thank you for coming uh, back to Cleveland, Mr. Secretary, and thanks for your presentation. Uh, recently, we've heard some discussion from a lot of our older uh, first ring communities around the city of Cleveland talking about the, the crippling uh, related cost to the infrastructure, yeah. dealing with sewer, water, and those costs, how they impede and can impede uh, because of their, uh, the, uh, the immensity of those costs, a lot of the progress and prioritization. Uh, I'm sure uh, Seattle and regions dealt with those, those challenges. Just as we think about uh, ways to reinvest in, in communities where there is high need and, and high poverty, but that seemed to be dominating the conversation. Uh, any guidance in terms of creating that balance uh, that you might share with us would be appreciated. The, uh, our state had a growth management act, which really helped a lot. Um, and when I became county executive, I said I was never going to move it. And then I defined every area west of it urban and every area east of it agricultural, resource, and rural. And I held the line. I remember bringing the uh, builders in and the environmentalists in and saying, 
I will not fight any urban development, but I will be absolutely a warrior if we go beyond that urban rural line. And the reason why is that it is absolutely, in my opinion, irresponsible financially to extend a infrastructure that you cannot in the long run re replace or maintain. It is just unbelievable to me. Uh, and America is going to find out as we begin to toll and assess higher costs to replace that infrastructure that this is going to be, that it isn't all free. You know, a roadway that extends is not free. It isn't. Um, and somebody's going to have to replace it. And why should the region replace the fact that you move to a distant location? Also, what's so crazy about that is we looked at who defaulted on mortgages. And people are blaming the, the person who came in and signed the document and saying that they did subprime. Well, that was in part. But the big factor was that 34% of the cost still was for the mortgage. 38% of the cost was for transportation. It was another 28 to 32% that was involved in energy, leaving people with margins of 5% of income to live on. You cannot do that. And all you had to do is have one person lose their job or go half time and it was over. We never factored in transportation costs at all. So when I look today at the fact that transportation costs, which is normally fuel and car and the insurance for them, are going to be compounded because you're going to be doing tolls, there are going to be a lot more people out there who are at the very, very edge. So when I look at infrastructure replacement, I look and say, why? Everybody believes if I allow my area to grow and grow and grow, we'll prosper. Well, there, it, you know, that is so short-sighted. I hate to be as blunt as it is. It is easier to contain your boundaries and grow within it where you already have sewer systems and distribution systems and health systems than it is to continue to say, I'm going to add 10 more acres on for development purposes. That is not responsible. And all over the country, we're finding that out now because Congress won't authorize the gas tax. And actually, there's a, at least some Congress is not ready to authorize a new gas tax. They said, we'll keep what we have. So why don't we begin to look at other ways to replace, like selling your infrastructure or charging you for its use? And that is going to be what we're going to have to do because gas tax is unreliable, trust me. I have, I, 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 my wife bought a hybrid. It gets 44.5 miles per gallon, right? I tell my son that he is subsidizing me because his vehicle does not. And, um, and so it's increasingly as technology changes and gas prices influence behavior, people are going to do that. There was a recent study that came out two days ago, which is really interesting. It took two sets of people in our area, Seattle, but it's done all over the country, and said, if you took the bus because you had public transit available, or if you drove, the difference in annual expenditures for household was $11,000. Right? Now, everybody's saying, wow, you know, what were the elements of it? But it was a group of economists, which is nice because now economists are really rethinking. We used to have GNP. We abandoned it because it didn't make sense. We had GDP, which we're also abandoning it because it doesn't make any sense because it never counts what you save in terms of a cost decision. So I look and say communities that are conservative are not going to allow sprawl, are not going to allow the extension of infrastructure. They're going to make the areas that are already urban more urban and more dense because that is the conservative, smart thing to do with people's money. If people want to live at a distance, they should pay for the infrastructure they're going to get, and it's going to be ill-afforded for many people. I hate to be that blunt, but the numbers are the numbers, and it's all over the country. And every buddy in office now is wrestling with it. What do I do to pay for this infrastructure? And in our, the, 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 the governor tasked me with an issue when I first got back. The issue is how do you avoid a $1.75 billion utility cost that every utility in Puget Sound is going to face? Can we figure out another way to handle it? Can we do, have science enter and tell us what is the best benefit? Can we look at it, the Puget Sound as a common ecosystem? But all that $1.75 billion was attributable to growth. With people saying, oh, wow, you know, my new development doesn't have a cost. It certainly has a cost. It had a wastewater cost. It had a stormwater cost. And it has a CS overflow cost. And now it's contaminated Puget Sound. And we're by law required to, to save the sound the same way people had to save Lake Erie, right? 
So these costs are going to continue to mount. If you commute, I can tell you, if you commute for an hour a day, you're more likely to have a heart attack at 72. Matter of fact, if, you were, if Vegas was allowed to bet on it, they would bet on your heart attack at 72 years old if you're a white male with an hour commute. Mm -hmm. Human body was never designed for one hour, excuse me, for, for what we call 13 hour day. One up in the morning where you're in distress as soon as your kids get into your life. <laughs> you commute for an hour, you work for eight hours, you go home for an hour, you're back in, in for an hour, and at 8.30 at night, what do you normally say to your spouse? Your spouse may say things like, we need to talk about the kids. I am too tired. <laughs> Lord, if you talk about money. It gets to be rancorous, right? Because you don't have, you're not relaxed, you're still under stress. That accumulative stress has its impact. One of the reasons why we believe that people who are older are moving back into the cities is in fact an issue of not having that stress constant in their life. Not being away all the time, not having long distances to go to the grocery store or to the shopping center or any place else, having amenities close by. And when you survey them, that's the first thing they say, everything was close. We could walk there. Um, but I, I, am a, I am not a fan of uh, long distances. I have not been. And right now, so right now, there are a number of economists who are basically challenging us. The infrastructure bill is so large in this country, it's $4 trillion of un funded investment in existing infrastructure, not even new, right, that has no source of payment. I, I, you should be worried because uh, I don't know where that money is going to come from other than all of a sudden say let's constrain growth and extend less of it. I didn't mean to go on and on. That's, that's, I didn't want to have a depressing thought. But. Yes, sir. Yeah. You've been mentioning the uh, growth management boundary, which is uh, quite different than what we have here. We suffer from probably the largest uh, experience of sprawl based upon being a place that has home rule and uh, a number of several different emerging municipalities and counties. What have been the bene what benefits can you uh, attribute to the growth man management boundary that's common to several, uh, not only to Washington, but also to Oregon and other areas uh, in the Northwest that practice growth management boundary practices regarding uh, land use? Uh, because we are constrained, uh, we have substantial, I mean, King County still is the eighth largest agricultural county in our state, and we have 39 counties. Uh, we have, a, you know, King County alone acquired 195,000 acres of forest that will be preserved in perpetuity. Uh, but we're very green, and we have concentrated our growth in the cities, and they're prospering. Even during this recession, everybody got hit. But remember, people still moved in the area, and we have probably very low unemployment relative to other communities because we did, we did not lose people's financial capacity to spend on roadways as much as they were able to spend those within walking distances of their home in their cities. So it was just a good economic decision. It calibrates that way. It looks that way. Same way with Portland. And we're still not very attractive to businesses because businesses hate paying for anticipated charges. When people go into now, when you're recruiting businesses now, they go through an entire area. They look at every place. And in their minds, I either say, should I locate here, or is this called a ka -ching? I'm going to be their new ka -ching. And so what you're finding a lot of cities now saying, hold a second, you know, we're going to exempt you from all future rates. I mean, that's really amazing how they can do that. Here are the incentives for locating here, because nobody wants to be the ATM machine to poor planning. So home rule, and we had a home rule area. I remember having a debate with a person who said, I'm going to build a community. And I said, are you going to have any fire there? We're not going to have any fires. I said, are you going to have any domestic violence? No domestic violence and no crime. <laughs> no health, no need for 911 services. No need because our people are going to be healthy and fit. And when he so wrote off so many costs, but he did it on TV in a debate in front of me. And people never forgot that debate. It was really, people said, wow, you just let him talk. I said, yeah, sometimes it's good to just shut up and let a person fall into the abyss. And, uh, uh, but that stimulated, that stimulated a lot of discussion, and we were very lucky to have some very prudent legislators. You know, the issue is that there's no free lunch. My first job, there was an economist named Randy Smith. I'll never forget him. And he, had, he put bread up on the table and said, how much does this bread cost? 
Well, one, it, it was wheat bread, and I didn't eat that. So I said, why can you put Wonder Bread up there? Because that's the bread I eat. <laughs> Not anymore, but at that time. <laughs> and so he would pull out a slice and say, how much does this slice cost? He'd give us the price of the loaf. And then he went into all the other costs associated with bread. And he said, I want you to know there's no free lunches anywhere. There's no free lunches to sprawl. It comes back as a cost, a health cost, a cost to schools, a cost to infrastructure. They're not free, and they never pay back. That's the thing that is, you know, we pointed out. You're out there, but you're relying on older infrastructure to subsidize it. It never pays for itself, otherwise it could never be built. And it just seems to me, why continue to shoot ourselves in the foot by subsidizing it when we build it and having to subsidize it when we want to reclaim its function and repair its function and maintain it. So I, it, if it made good financial sense, I'd say go for it. But, you know, I'm waiting. There's, just, there's no numbers that justify it. And it's America's big challenge for the future. Well beyond President Obama, somebody's going to have to figure out how to pay for it. It also has allowed us to conveniently abandon communities rather than make them work. Right? So it's easy to say, oh, that's a lousy neighborhood. Well, I moved into an abandoned neighborhood. Now the Microsoft people took over, so we did well on equity, but we can't afford to buy into our own neighborhood anymore. But the, it was really interesting how people, housing was cheap. And we said, whoa, you can get a really cheap house. My house was on the market for six months. That was the first offer they took it. The house next to me was on the market for 18 months. It doesn't happen in my neighborhood anymore. But the interesting thing is when we moved in, the neighborhood changed fundamentally. Because we moved in and said, We're, there's no good schools here. All of a sudden, we started agitating for good schools and went to the school district and said, you know, we are big, we're big voters too. If you want our levy votes, we want good schools. We want good streets. We want good parks. So you took a neighborhood that everybody had abandoned and made it a good neighborhood. But we were all liberals in that neighborhood. So we said, you know, there's some areas that are really poor nearby and they're going to have good parks. And they're their kids are going to go to our schools and our neighborhood because we want them going to really good schools. And they're going to have a public transportation system. And the light rail system was built. It was built in our neighborhood first for the communities most impacted. Uh, so it changed politically how we developed because we didn't allow people to run away from southeast Seattle, the home of Ambassador Locke, former Mayor uh, Norm Rice, and former Deputy Secretary Ron Sims. We love southeast. Uh -oh. Yes. Thank you so much for all, all, all that, that you've said. Uh, I just want to ask you, ask you a very quick question. Certainly undergirding a lot of what you're talking about deals with issues of access, race, and space, and which becomes very difficult to bring, to expand our, our base, get more people talking about that. And certainly that's key if we're going to move forward. What's, what's some ideas of, of how do we expand this? and to give more people at the table. I used to have meetings, and I would tell people in the meeting, I, I'm not, my, I had an interesting rule. I said, I'm going to bring you to the meeting. I'm not asking anybody to love anybody. I'm not even asking you to get married. But I am going to ask you to benefit the community by setting all those things aside and working to a common goal. And that was often really, really hard but I was so deliberate at cutting off people where I thought race or class was entering it or disability or orientation was entering it or different faiths. Everybody had a reason not to work. Everybody did. It came in with their, you know, and the idea was who wins when you do that? And so I just set the table up, but I didn't wait for the right time because there's no waiting for the right time. There's never a good time. The, the, the only right time is to make it happen. I always use this phrase, my wife's from the Philippines. I never thought in Spokane well, I ever marry anybody from the Philippines. I never even knew where it was. I said it was by Hawaii. Uh, I just didn't know where it was. She's from an extended family, and uh, I'm from a nuclear one. She's from a multilingual family. I'm from a monolingual family. She, I eat meat and potatoes, and she eats rice and fish. Now, many things have yielded over the course of our marriage. I don't remember the last time I had meat. Uh, I... <laughs> I, rice is our staple. My, my kids grew up eating peanut butter and jelly on pan de sol and pan de leche. That was a give. Uh, yam pie is not negotiable uh, at all. Um, and so I've always said if my wife and I can get along, anybody can. 
Um, she's very Catholic. I'm very Baptist. Um, you know, there's nothing we have in common in our bringing. Nothing. Nothing. Not a single thing. <laughs> but purpose. But purpose. Our children were our purpose. Our children were. And I think that people have got to set aside their differences and focus on purpose. Racism is un-American in a country that is founded because, on, like I said, we're the only country in the history of the world with no common gene pool. We all got here by a boat plane on a blind bridge. We got here by aspiration and design. So I look and say people's hang-ups in many cases are simply un-American and our issue is to challenge that, not let people get away with it, so that people can enclave themselves. Oh, great, you know, and that has never had a good political outcome. Enclaves don't work. Never have, never will. Ever. Ever. I, and people say, well, I, you know, I, I feel comfortable. Get uncomfortable. Uh, enclaves don't work. And so a lot of cities have them. A lot of failing cities have them. And some of the roughest meetings I was in as the HUD Dep were in places where people said, we didn't get anything from you because the people who always got it, got it. The people always in control were the ones in control. And I mean, they were brutal. I mean, they were brutal. One of the things I don't have to do in the HUD anymore is go anymore to those brutal meetings. <laughs> but those were cities that had not resolved their racial issues. There were black neighborhoods and Latino neighborhoods and white neighborhoods and affluent neighborhoods, and never would the twain meet. And I just go, this is just, you know, no. I mean, and people have got to stand up to it. The community that I am stunned by their silence because it is the most segregated day in American history is religious days, Saturday and Sunday. And they are segregated, and we know they are. And I always look and say, hold it a second, I'm a preacher's kid, right? And my father used to get up on Sundays and say, what is wrong with this? So he used to make a church go out and find people who would not normally come to an African-American church, right? And so I grew up in a way when people just had to reach out. But the silence of the faith-based community has got to end. It really does have to end. Practice what you preach. Practice what you preach. The Old Testament and the New Testament are prime examples of people not practicing what they preach. If you're Muslim, whole storylines are based on people not practicing what you preach. If you're Buddhist or Confucius, I don't care what faith you come from, people don't practice what you preach. It's time for people to say, if they say, I believe in something, then walk your talk. Believe in what you say others should live by. And that's really important. So I love the faith-based community like you're doing here who have got up and decided that place will not be a factor in the lives of the next generation. I want to thank you for getting up to do that because no other faith-based community in the entire United States has been willing to do that. We've all been willing to say, oh, they're poor. The government will help them. But you have made a decision, no, that people will help them and the faith-based community will help them. I want to thank you for doing that. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we have been listening to Ron Sims, former Deputy Secretary for the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban, Urban Development. Thank you, Mr. Sims, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This forum is adjourned.